great deal of suspicion, fear, and trepidation. Um, and I think I must have been like that a long time ago as well, so I understand that. But what we'll do is run through some of the basics, which is going to be rather dull and uninteresting to start with. But it gives you the ground language that you need to understand what follows. Because if you don't understand what electrophysiology is about, how it's formed, where the upward signals come from, you can never understand how to apply it to the management of the patient. And that's what it's all about. Because electrophysiology gives us an objective evaluation of function and structure. We all know about the structure and there's been massive improvements in structuring, structural abilities and imaging and whatever you over the last 20 years or so. But this will tell us about the function. Now the test we've got available to us, the visual evoked potential or VEP, comes from the back of the head. It's a very sensitive measure of dysfunction and it's hopelessly non-specific because it comes from the back of the head. So it can be affected by dysfunction anywhere anterior to the cortex or in the cortex itself. So it could be the optic chiasm, it could be the optic nerve, it could be the macula, it could be a cataract, it could be poor refraction, it could be the patient falling asleep, it could be dirty spectacles. They will all give you an abnormal VEP. Non-specific, sensitive, non-specific. And we're mostly concentrating on the first part of the talk, the sort of first two talks, all in one, on the way we investigate the function of the retina with electroretinography, electrooculography, and patniography. So electroretinography uses a full field of luminance stimulus. <laughs> Patniology uses a contrast stimulus, but more about that later. If the people at the back ever lose track of what I'm saying, please tell me to either shout or to get somebody to turn the volume up. Is it okay as it is? Great. Um, so we'll be concentrating on this area here. Now you know, as ophthalmologists, that the eye is very small, but it's massively complex, with many, many cell types and layers, etc. And electrophysiology is very, very good at looking at vertical transmission through the retina. So the light comes through, photoreceptors here, and of course we've got lots of photoreceptors. There's about 120 million rods, six to seven million cones, and the cones come in three flavors, long wavelength, medium wavelength, and short wavelength, which used to be called red, green, and blue. Those names are not appropriate, are best dropped. And then, what happens first is as light hits there, phototransduction takes place in the outer segments of the photoreceptors. That sets up the electrical signal in which goes then from photoreceptors, already presses phototransduction, uh, to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells, and then it's the axons of the ganglion cells which form the optic nerve and take the message to the brain. And of course it's in the brain that vision takes place. Vision doesn't take place in the eye. The eye is merely there as a means of distributing the information to the brain, and it's the brain that determines how we see and what we see. Electrooculography tells us about the interaction between the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. Electroretinography, full field ERG, tells us about the photoreceptors in the inner nuclear layer, and the pattern ERG about the retinal ganglion cells. This is unstable. Now this is the phototransduction cascade, a simplified version. I'm not going to do it. And I'm indebted to Bart for a while for this marvelous color. Could people turn their phones on silent if they have their phones with um, And the only purpose of this is to show you that the genes encoding these proteins all can be mutated. And all will be with disease. So it's very important that you look at the function because this is just simply the phototransduction cascade. And if we then extend that further, and we look at, this is from RepNet recently, uh, this is up to date as of yesterday, we've got more than 300 mapped genes which are responsible for retinal disease. More than 250 have been identified, so it's very complicated, because they all manifest in different ways. And we use electrophysiology to characterize the nature of disorders. So you'll be familiar with rod cone dystrophy, 
or recognised as pigmentosa. So that's the most commonly inherited generalised social receptor dystrophies. But then you've got the cone rod dystrophies, the cone dystrophy, the macular dystrophy. And when I say macular dystrophy and cone dystrophy, what's the difference? Well, a macular dystrophy affects the macula and the macula only. Cone dystrophy affects the whole cone population, which may or even in some instances may not involve macular cones. So we distinguish between the macular cones and the peripheral cones. You've got the early onset retinal dystrophies, which includes LCA, choroideremia, a whole bunch of genes which produce disorders which don't really fit into these categories. And one of the questions that I'm often asked is, are ERGs ever diagnostic? And there are three rare gene disorders in which case one could say yes. And that's KCMB2, RGS9, and r 2 3 And Adrian's asked me specifically to address those, and we will do so later. All of these genes, for example, are known to cause recognized pigmentosa. I don't expect you to look at them, memorize them, or anything like that. You know, it's just a list of genes. And it just demonstrates how much complexity there is, because they were all <coughs> to dominantly inherited, recessively inherited, X-linked, and three of those, so that's relatively simple to remember. But all of these present in different ways, in different ages, with different severities, with different fundus appearance, but they all share a common path. And we can also get inner retinal disease, which give you what's called a negative ERG, and more about that later. And that's ethnoskysis, various forms of congenital stationary night blindness, TRNT1 mutation, relatively recently described, fat disease, CLN3, and there are others. And even then, there's an overlap. So different mutations in the same gene can give you different diseases. If we think, for example, about PRPH2, which is there somewhere, that can give you a cone rod dystrophy, it can give you RP, it can give you macular dystrophy, and it can give you a cone dystrophy, sometimes in the same family. So from a counseling point of view and a managing point of view, even knowledge of the gene mutation is not ideal. You need the functional assessment provided by electrophysiology to enable you to discuss meaningfully the disease of the patient who carries that particular mutation and manifests the disease with that particular phenotype. Right, that's the general introduction. Now a little bit about the basics of anatomy. We know that the photoreceptors are many, and we know that they have an uneven distribution. If we look at the distribution of the rods, they're maximum about 20 degrees out. And in the fovea, there's a rod free area, and there's a high density of cone photoreceptors. But don't forget, of course, that the cones go all the way out to the orosorata. If they didn't, we wouldn't be able to walk through doors, bump into things, because we wouldn't have peripheral fields. And it's important to remember that the cones go all the way out. So, where are we going? ERG. Objective demonstration of retinal function. And by changing the adaptive state of the eye and the nature of the stimulus, we separate the function of the different cell types and layers. The retinal rods, more sensitive to darkness, or patients need to be dark adapted. Cones, operational in large, bright light conditions. So we trigger the stimulus, we trigger the recording conditions to that. We need electrodes, because these are electrical signals, so we need electrodes to measure these small signals. And these sit on the cornea usually. This is the ATK looped electrode, uh, devised by Michael Holina in Slovenia. This is the DTL electrode, which we are currently using at Tampa Sane and at NUH. This is the gold foil electrode, which we also see on Moorfields, where it's developed by my predecessor, the late Jeffrey Arden. And you can also use contact lens electrodes, but for pattern ERGs where you're using structured stimulants, contact lens electrodes are much appropriate because they interfere with the optics of the eye. And you'll see why that's important as we move on. Now, all of these are ERGs. We start off with a dim flash. Signals get bigger, the shape changes. This is a blue flash, this is a red flash. With a red flash, you get an early cone component, a late rod component, and this is a white flash. And it doesn't take an electrophysiologist to see that they're all different. So standardization is absolutely fundamental to a meaningful recording of an electroretinal. 
you have to do the same thing in Singapore, as you do in London, as you do in Tokyo, as you do in everywhere in the world. So there has to be an international language of communication, and that's the International Society of the Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision Standards, which are published and reviewed every four years for all of the main tests. And the only thing I want you to remember from this slide is that if you use a red flash, you get something coming from the dark adaptive cones and a response from the rods. These two are classified. So standardization is important. Now, when you think about interpretation of the RGs, you kind of record the signals. So the first thing you have to do is understand the origins of the signal. We'll look at that, we'll look at that in the next slide. And then when you want to apply it to an individual patient with an individual disease, the next thing you have to do is understand the pathophysiology of the disease. Because you have to relate the recorded signals to the underlying pathology. And this is where that knowledge becomes important. And it's particularly true if anybody's reporting the ERGs on their own patients. Because they've seen the patient, they come to a clinical decision, they do the ERG. And they usually do the ERG to confirm their suspicions. And that in lies disaster. Because you must always make the diagnosis fit the electric physiology and never ever make the electrophysiology fit the diagnosis. So if you have to prove yourself wrong, that's what you do. Because the electrophysiology is the signature of the disease. So that's what you interpret. You don't use your clinical knowledge, you don't use what you've seen in the patient. You prove yourself wrong if need be, but you use the objective data to make the diagnosis, placing that data in clinical context not using your clinical knowledge to adapt the data to make the diagnosis fit what you think it is. And that's really important. So, the minimum standard for an ERG incorporates these four basic ERGs. We use a dim flash and a dark adapted eye. So we dark adapt the patient, fully dilated. They sit in a gantry bowl, which is a means of delivering the stimulus uniformly to the whole retina. And we've got the electrodes here at the gold foil electrodes, doesn't matter what you use. And this is taken in total darkness using an infrared camera because the technician needs to be able to see that the electrodes are in the right place, the patient's got their eyes open, the patient's looking where they're supposed to look, the electrodes haven't fallen out, etc. etc. That's important. And first thing we do when we dark attack the patient, with using a relatively dim flash, we get a response known as a B wave. And this arises in the on bipolar cells of the rod system. So the stimulus intensity or strength, which is what these numbers reflect, um, this, this is simply a measure in 10 milliseconds per meter squared. It doesn't matter what the unit is. The smaller the number, the more dim the flash. The larger the number, the brighter the flash. And that's all that's important. So this is a dim flash. It's below the cone threshold. So you're not going to get any response from the rod cones at all even though it's dark adapted, they're sensitive. And this comes from the on bipolar cells in the rod system. But because it's arising at an inner retinal level, you can't use it to localize dysfunction either to the photoreceptors or to the inner retina itself. So it's sensitivity, not specificity. Then when you use a bright flash, so this is now a thousand times brighter, You've got a now what most people call an ERG, there's an A wave and a B wave. The A wave here is somewhere between 250 and 450 microvolts. So these are pretty big signals by the physiological standards. And the A wave now is peaking at about 10 or 11 milliseconds. And we know that the first eight milliseconds or so from John Robson's work reflects directly the hyperpolarization of photoreceptors. So the ERG is actually given as a handle on biochemical activity within the photoreceptors. And you can correlate the slope of the A wave to the kinetics of phototransduction. This, because we've now got a response coming from photoreceptors, the inner nuclear layer continues to produce the B wave, we've now got specificity. So this gives us sensitivity, this gives us specificity. Now, there is a cone component buried within this, 
which in a normal person you can't see. You've only got six or seven million cones, you've got 120 million rods, the rods are shouting and the cones are whispering. So we can't see that, but it's there. And if you have rod disease, then what you get left with may come from the cones, and that's important. But we test the cones specifically by light adapting the patient. So we turn on a background light here in the gas star. We then flash a light at 30 times a second. Now the temporal resolution of the rods is poor. They can't follow a light flash at 30 times a second. So that's a cone-driven response. But in parallel with this response here, it's arising at an inner retinal level. So it's driven through the cone growth receptors, yes, but arising at an inner retinal level. So this again is sensitivity within the cone system. And then in order to get specificity, we use a single flash cone ERG. So we've got a background light which stays on. That suppresses the function of the rods. You then flash on top of that rod suppressing background, and you record a single flash coming from the cone system. And now we have a cone A wave, cone B wave. The cone A wave comes from the first receptors modified by the off bipolar cells. You'll remember that long and medium wavelength cones are both on and off by focus of pathways. Test cones are like rods, they're in an on pathway. And the B wave comes as a synchronized response from the on and off pathway because the stimulus is really, really short. So it's up. You get the on and the off at the same time. It's synchronized from the on by photo cells from the off by photo cells. And this is your basic minimum. Measurement. Three things. Size, so measured in microvolts. Timing, from stimulus onset to the peak. Stimulus onset to the peak. But also the shape. The shape's more difficult to quantify. Shape's something you learn by experience and you recognize. But you'll see why it happens in more than one And this is a minimum recording, a recommendation. So if you haven't done this, you haven't done the ERG. But this is a minimum. In some diseases, you will not be able to make an accurate diagnosis particularly with this. It's also important to know what happens when you... Ah. Uh, well, uh, the connections... Sorry, I thought this was not it. Um, You've got bipolar cells which are two types. You've got depolarized, which are an on bipolar cell, and hyperpolarized, which are an off bipolar cell. And the rods talk only through on bipolar cells, and the cones talk both on and off bipolar cells. So when you put the on stimulus, it triggers, and then when you turn the stimulus off, it triggers the off bipolar cells. So you've got one responsible for on information, the other responsible for off information. In the rods and in the shortwave in cones, off information doesn't go through the bipolar cells, goes short circuit through the atrium amacrine cells and then tails into the other end of the, the cone system. So the off information from the rod system actually feeds into the tail end of the cones by the atrium amacrine system. Okay, so this is looking at stimulus strength and rods and cones behave different. In the rod system here, we've got our dim, very dim flash. Here's our ISIP standard response with the B wave, and not much of an A wave. Now, as we increase stimulus strength, the A wave comes in, gets shorter, gets narrower. But the B wave is always significantly larger than the A wave. In the cone system, that's not true. What happens in the cone system, so this is a light adapted ERG with increasing flash strength. As we start off dim, we get a small response, a small response. And this is the ISIF standard called sign of intensity, where the B wave to A wave ratio is about three or four to one. And then as we further increase stimulus strength, paradoxically almost, the A wave continues to increase, but the B wave gets smaller. How can that happen? It goes back to understanding the signal origins. Because the A wave comes from the first receptors and the off bipolar cells, the B wave is a synchronized response from on and off systems. But as you increase stimulus strength, the off bipolar cells change their timing characteristics, you lose the synchronization. And 
what happens then is that the A wave continues to increase. And you can see what happens here with the B wave. The first thing that happens is the timing increases. And then it gets broadened because you're separating what were two responses which are synchronized into two responses which are separate. So they effectively get smaller. I mean, if I ask you all to clap at exactly the same time, it's a loud clap, okay? But if you all clap slightly separate from each other, then it gets spread out, it's broadened, and it's not so loud. And that's what's happening electrically in the rack. The full family RG is normal in diseases of the macula. So if the macula is, uh, alone is involved, the full field RG is completely normal. So if you want to find out the cause of somebody's visual acuity loss, full field RG will never answer that question. So you need to be able to test the macula separately. And there are two ways of doing that. First is with a patni RG, and now you see why you need electrodes which spare the optics of the eye. Because the patient is looking at a structured stimulus they need to be refracted, and they need to be able to see without a horrible, distorting contact lens placed in front of them. That's why you need electrodes like this, which allow the optical pathway to be completely unimpaired. So the electrode must preserve the optics. Reference electrodes, I'm, I'm not going to go into the technical side of recording, um, that's not what we're here for. But suffice it to say that if you follow things appropriately, you get a small signal with a positivity, negativity. And rather than the hundreds of microvolts that you get for the full field ERG, these guys are small. You need to use computerized signal averaging to extract them. But once you take into account all the necessary technical factors, test, retest, trial to trial variability is about the same as a full field ERG. So it's a reliable signal. They need good technicians. In terms of origins, we're pretty well sorted where things come from, but only pretty well. So we know that the negative component in 95 arises in the ganglion cells, and that's from our clinical work, the law of experimental work. This will be addressed further in the, the, the lecture after tea, uh, after coffee. And P50, we don't know its origins fully. We know about 70% of it comes from the ganglion cells. But the most important thing is that P50 is driven by the macular photoreceptors. So it acts objectively as a measure of the function. So in terms of an abnormality, if you've got a maculopathy, you lose P50, preservation of the N95 P50 ratio. And if you've got ganglion cell disease, as we'll see later, P50 is preserved, but the N95 component can show selective loss. The other way of looking at central macular function is using a multifocal ERG. So this is now a checkable uh, hexagonal stimulus, which looks like that, and then some cross-correlation to form a, it's supposed to just be, <laughs> that's intriguing. That's a severe image. Never mind. Uh, cross-correlation then extracts all of these and relates them to the individual <coughs> hexagons, so you get a map. And these look remarkably like real electrophysiology. They're actually a mathematical construct but it gives you a map of cone system activity. So here we can tell we're looking at the left eye, because this response is slightly smaller, so that tells us we're over the optic disc. This is the phobia, so the arcades will be around the sort of area. Now, what I want to do now, oh, it is of course important that the patient can maintain good fixation because the machine is black box technology. The machine doesn't know where the patient is looking. It has to assume the patient is fixating accurately. Now let's start thinking about disease. We're almost at the bit where it's going to get interesting. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Trust me, we will get there. Uh, so if we've got a patient with a pure macular dystrophy, the central part of the multifocal ERG will be undetectable. The pattern ERG will be undetectable. By definition, the full field ERG will be normal. Because as soon as the full field ERG becomes abnormal, it then either becomes a cone or a cone rod or a rod cone dystrophy. Definition. That's how these disorders are defined and established. 
So in a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, and this would be so-called classical RP, where the patient's got constricted fields, then within that area of remaining field, which may be five or eight degrees, function is preserved. And then you can get preservation of the central part of the multifocal. The pattern the RG can be completely normal, even when the full field of the RG is virtually undetectable, because it's only looking at central macula. And then the multifocal shows lots of the signals around the outside, preservation of the inside. So that's how the tests are used when it's combined. So now we get a clinical case. This is where we're moving. So everybody knows what this is. This is ABCA4 retinopathy, it's Stargardt disease. It used to be called fungus clade maculatus, Stargardt fungus clade maculatus. And we're in an era at the moment where nomenclature is changing, gene discovery is changing the way we look at things. The textbooks written last year are no longer up to date and they're no longer accurate, more about that later. So we're gradually switching to names of genes rather than the names of people who first report the disorder. This is classical, there's some small flat lesions surrounding an area of central atrophy. When you do autofluorescence imaging, you've got an area of atrophy, you've got hyperfluorescent and hypofluorescent effects. So this is absolutely classic for OCFO disease. And we look at the OCT, and we can see lots of the outer retinal structure which is central and concentric around the phobia. So as we go away from the area of atrophy, we've got preservation of outer retinal structure, and it's centered on the phobia. And we do our full field ERG. Now, all of the clinical ERGs will be shown in the same way. There will be normal along the bottom, left eye, right eye, the main ERG responses, the four that we've looked at, and here, two fields of pattern ERG, a 15-degree field and a 30-degree field. The full field ERGs are completely normal. There's no peripheral retinal involvement at all. The central pattern ERG, a 15-degree field, is undetectable. With a 30-degree field, we've got a response which is 2, 2.5 two microvolts, much less than that in a normal, but detectable. So it tells us that once we move outside of that 15-degree field, we've got function which is preserved and we can document and quantify. And we've got central ones. And then when we look at the multifocal ERG, we've got preservation around the outside and we've got an area of loss. But the area of loss is there. And yet the phobia is here. So who's wants to tell me what's going on there? Anybody brave enough to tell me what's happening? Spreading disease, that's one possibility. Thank you very much indeed, that's exactly right. Anybody with a central scotoma will learn, most people anyway, if they're young enough, will learn eccentric fixation because that will maximize the ability of their remaining visual system to give them the information they need from the outside world. And all that's happening here is that the patient is fixating there because that's where they see most of what they will. They've learned eccentric fixation the machine doesn't know that the patient is eccentrically fixating, so the machine produces its map. So this is simply an artifact of fixation. It doesn't say that's where the disease is. It simply says that's where the patient is fixating. So all of these tests have to be taken with riders, with caution. You have to understand the way they work. Once you understand the way they work, then you've got a good idea of being able to apply them accurately so multifocal ERGs are really powerful, but they're black box technology. You've got no control over what the machine does, and the machine doesn't know what the patient's doing. So technicians have to be skillful, patients have to be able to fix it. Then it's really powerful. Just a word of caution. Okay, now let's move into the main part of the talk. So that's all been introduction. Hopefully it's giving you now a language that we can communicate with. So let's look at photoreceptor disease. And if we've got disease of the photoreceptors, having suggested that the A wave arises in them, then we'd expect our bright flash under dark adaptation to show A wave reduction because that's where the signal is coming from the photoreceptors. And in terms of interpretation, our 0, 1 response, the dim flash, if that's reduced, sensitivity, not specificity, 
then when we use a bright flash and the A wave is markedly reduced compared to normal, then that tells us the disease is in the blood receptors, not in a red one. So sensitivity, specificity. Now the most common of the inherited dystrophies is retinitis pigmentosa. It's extraordinarily heterogeneous, as you've seen from that list of genes that can give you the disease. But they share a common pathway. The disease starts in the rods. As the rods die, the cones become involved. So it's a rod cone dystrophy. The first symptom is nearly always night blindness. But if you live in Singapore, it's kind of crazy asking patients for night blind because they never get dark. <laughs> There's so many lights everywhere. Um, the type of questions you might want to ask is if they're ever in the countryside in another country, uh, can they see a sky full of stars? For me, stars in Singapore are something like I remember from Europe. Um, very rare to see them. Um, and if they go to a cinema or a theatre, do they? Can they find their own way to the seat when they go from the bright body to the dark seat, or do they need to? And I always ask people if they're similar to their friends rather than their relatives, because of course the relatives may suffer the same disorder. So the night blind, the visual field constricts because of the cone involvement. So the first field defect we get in RP is the ring scotoma, and that corresponds to maximum rod density, about 20 degrees out. So as the rods die, the cones die. That's when you get the field defect. When you get photoreceptor cell death, you then get pigment migration from RP into neural retina. So when you see bone spicules, you know at least in that area you have cell death. Not dysfunction, but death. Because that's when you get the pigment migration. So a patient like this with massive bone spicules, pale discs, narrow vessels, will have no detectable PRG. And we're back from big In fact, about one in 4,000, we've already seen the different inheritance patterns, and it may be syndromic. Now this is a typical case, it comes in to you, and the patient's complaining, doctor, I can't see very well in the dark. And you look in the eye, and in the right eye, you see this mottled appearance, this sort of gray mottled appearance which we associate with autosomal morphological change. And in the left eye, we see one or two bone spindles. The vasculature looks pretty good, the rest of it looks fine, the acuity is good. So, Yes, you can answer the question, is there RP? But the patient then says, Doc, how bad is it? So what criteria are you going to choose? Now, you've got this in front of you. And you've got three choices. It's mild, it's moderate, or it's severe. This is where you have to wake up and do just a little bit of work. So who thinks it's mild, this disease? A few hands going up. Who thinks it's moderate? Maybe a few more hands going on. So either the rest of you think it's severe, or the rest of you are asleep. So let's try again. Come on, play the game. I, you know, I'm not going to do this very often. Who thinks it's mild? Oh, more hands. So the clinical opinions change over time. OK, moderate. Most people think it's moderate. Severe? <laughs> he knows. <laughs> He's seen a lot of retinal disease. So only one person gets it right. We'll talk about why after. We can do autofluorescence imaging. If you do autofluorescence imaging, you see there's a ring of increased hyper autofluorescence surrounding the folia, which as some of you may know where I worked at Warfields in the Institute of Ophthalmology. We devised this test originally, so I've been working with autofluorescence in 1995. And when we first started seeing it, we had no idea what the ring meant. And we actually used electrophysiology, varying sizes of pat LG, to show that within the rings, function is preserved, outside the ring, function is lost. And that's been now confirmed by SDOCT, where you see preservation of the outer retinal structures within the ring. It doesn't say they work, but in this instance they do. So that's preservation structure, and then outside of the ring, outer retinal structures are lost. So this demonstrates anatomically what we check functionally. Now, it's actually very severe. When we look at the rod-specific ERG, it's completely undetectable. So we've got severe rod system dysfunction. When we then, thinking of sensitivity, need our specificity, we go to the bright flash, 
the A wave is down to about 15% of the normal. So 85% of that retina has already stopped functioning. This is very severe disease. And I agree, you cannot tell by looking at the function. Most of you said moderate, one or two said mild, George was the only one who said severe, but you've seen the case before, so you can touch on What's happening in the cone system? Well, we've said it's a, cone, a rod cone dystrophy. Now, if it's got a rod cone dystrophy, the cones are going to be involved, what would they do? Well, here we see two different abnormalities. We see profoundly subnormal response when compared to the patient, uh, to a normal control, but we also see massive delay. And that delay is an indication of cellular dysfunction, not loss of function, which will give you amplitude reduction, but dysfunction. So when the cells don't work properly, it takes them longer to respond. So you see dysfunction as a delay. When we go to the pattern LG, 15 degree field is small, reasonably good. It's enough to give you 6566 six, six vision. Not a good measure of visual function, but it's okay. But when we go from a 15 degree field to a 30 degree field, in contrast to the patient we saw originally with OCA4 disease, star heart disease, where the central pattern LG was lost and the peripheral one was good, here there's no change whatsoever as we go from 15 to 30 degrees. So the area of retina between 15 and 30 degrees has already lost function. So that's the principles, rod system or the cone system involved, localization of the first receptor, degree of macular scaring, explains the visual acuity loss, uh, sorry, with the visual acuity preservation. That's where we're looking. So we combine all of those things together to give you a full impression of what's happening. So this is a patient who's 65 years of age, fungus abnormality noticed by an optometrist. He himself did not go there for symptoms, he went for a few pair of glasses. He's got difficulty with night vision on direct questioning, sensitivity to bright lights, head glasses, and things with him. No other history of the brother. And he's got an area of obvious atrophy with some pigment deposition. He's got an area of hypoal fluorescence surrounded by an area of hyperpurple fluorescence. So you look at this, and the clinical question that you have is, is it a photoreceptor dystrophy? And if so, is it restricted disease, or is it generalized disease? Because so-called sector retinitis pigmentosa is a good disease to have if you have to have retinitis pigmentosa because it's restricted disease. But you can get restricted pigmentary deposition in the context of generalized retinal disease. So you need the functional data to be able to determine what's happening. And then when we look at the ERGs, the timing is absolutely normal. The size is a bit small, but only a bit small. So this is true restricted loss of function. The patient does not have generalized RP, and this is a good continuation of the prognosis. It's not going to get worse. When we do the multifocal ERG, it corresponds beautifully to the visual fields. And you can map, to a certain extent, the field defects. But these should never be regarded as a substitute for visual fields. They're giving you different information. Visual fields are subject to threshold detection. Visual electrophysiology is supra-threshold. And sometimes the results will agree, sometimes they won't agree. It doesn't matter. They're giving you different information. Now let me get another patient like this, who also appears to have restricted disease. There's a very similar fungus appearance. There's a similar uh, autofluorescence appearance. That's slightly higher up on the left eye. So this patient is symptomatic because here you can see the central involvement uh, and he's down to 612. But other than that, it looks pretty similar. Is this restricted disease? Same question. Here, the whole ERG is almost undetectable. So this is very, very severe, generalized retinal dysfunction. And yet you'd look at it and you think, well, the inferior part looks pretty bad. The superiority, that looks fine. But the superiority also mostly lost on No detectable macular function, despite the good visual acuity, which is that you don't need many cells in the macula to give you 6-6 vision. 6-6 vision should never be regarded as normal vision. 
just the normal smell and visual acuity. Achromatic, square wave, um, high contrast. So there's no contrast loss. You can lose 50% of contrast, so that's six. Now, when you're interpreting ELGs, we've already just seen the examples of this. You have to understand the disease, understand the signals. So you need to ask yourself where the signals come from, how do they relate to the physiology, and do the ELGs, this minimum in the eyes of standard, can we actually answer the question? Now, this is a referral which came in when I was at Moorfield from one of the inherited diseases experts. If I, knew, if I mentioned his name, you would know his name. Um, this is a 12 year old with a family history of recognized Toza, night blind, no ocular signs of RP, so fine. So, very reasonable referral. Patient's night blind, got a positive family history, and he's been seen by a genetics expert who wants us to find out what the patient's got RP. And you look at the images, and the images are actually pretty good. You might think there's a possibly slightly hyperaldefluorescent, but for a 12 year old, our is normal. And then you do the ERGs. The rod ERG is completely undetectable. Bright flash dark <coughs> ERG is down to 120 microvolts or so. It should be 250 to 450. So there is marked loss here. So we've got severe rod system dysfunction. The cones are pretty good. We've got severe rod system dysfunction. So another show of hands. I'm not going to do this very often, but I'll just play the game. Who thinks the patient's got RP? Who thinks the patient has recognized pigmentosa? Some hands go up. More hands go up. Who thinks the patient does not have recognized pigmentosa? A few hands. So the question is, let me ask one of the people who thinks it's not RP what they think it is instead. Congenital stationary night blindness. Congenital stationary night blindness. As you'll see later on, this is not the kind of ERG you find if you get in that disease, but reasonable question. Anyone else want to step and have a good have a step? But you're thinking in terms of inherited disease. Okay, well, when you're looking at the ERGs, you have to identify the origins. So what we need to do is identify the origins of the DA10 response here. And we can't do that by looking at a white light. So we use our red flash on the mark adaptation where we should get an early component coming from dark adaptive cones, late component from the rods. So here in the normal, we see an early component coming from the rods, late component oh, from cones, late component from the rods, and we see an early component coming from the cones, and there is zero contribution coming from the rods. So in other words, this patient has a cone-isolated retina. And if the patient's got a cone-isolated retina, what is retinitis pigmentosa? It's a rod cone dystrophy. You can't lose rod function completely and not develop the cone. It just simply can't happen. So this cannot be RP. Now, fortunately, the technicians at Moorfields, and here and increasingly so in Singapore, are trained to take history. Now, you think, OK, I'm an ophthalmologist. I take history. But you're with the patient for 10 to 15 minutes. They're with the patient for two hours. They can get a much more detailed history than you can. And besides which, you've already asked them the questions that they then go home and ask their relatives and they think about answers and things like that. So technicians are really important. You, 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 you treat your technicians with enormous respect because they help you. And the technician took the history. The kid was autistic. His diet was dreadful. He had fried potatoes, skinny buns, <coughs> chocolate bars, yogurt. Very occasionally he would eat an apple. He was discharged by a dietitian as having stable weight, that's because he eats lots of skinny bones, dry eyes. So of course you're now thinking something completely different, you're now thinking about some major deficiency. And of course, with a cone-isolated retina, loss of rod function completely, preservation of retinal cones, it's now fitting into the understood pathophysiology of vitamin A deficiency, except vitamin A deficiency is treatable. So the kid had two intramuscular injections, and that's what happens to the left eye before and after. Complete normalization of the ERG. We now see the rod component coming in after the cone component. Bright flash A wave goes from 120 to 320 microvolts. And 
we've now restored in our function, the current, of course, stays exactly the same. So understanding the pathophysiology of the disease, rod, cone, dystrophy. And making sure that the technician knows appropriately, doing the test to end, ascertain the origin of the bright flash bar. In fact, you know, what here is coming from dark spectrum cones, not from rods. You make the diagnosis, you treat the patient, and everybody's happy. Particularly the family who are expecting their kid is right line to have a diagnosis of RP because that's what's in the rest of the family. Of course, you can get syndromic RP, Cardi Beetle, Batten, BFP, PFC, etc. You'll be familiar with all of those. But this is where things are changing. We're living at the moment in an era of complete flux because we've now got access to exome and genome sequences that we didn't have before. And very surprising results are being thrown out. We have the privilege of working with uh, Helen Dolphus in Strasbourg, who's Europe's main body beetle expert, on a whole bunch of patients. And we were able to identify, because body beetle is usually associated with broad cone dystrophy, patients are said to have body beetle. <coughs> And we were able to identify nine patients who had primarily cone disease, and yet who had positive mutations in body beetle genes. So the variants were confirmed, they were in genes previously associated with convention in body beetle, but they had cone disease, not rod disease. And I feel sorry for juniors who are coming up to exams because the textbooks are no longer right. They're changing almost as we speak. There's a new publication coming out exome sequencing in this disease, genome sequencing in that disease, and it's all changing. It's an extraordinarily exciting time to be working in red lab. But it's also not an easy time, because you can't say, for example, Stargardt fundus flavin maculosum, and there's no fundus flavin maculosum. You can have fundus albicum tarsus without the white dots. And that's why those names are beginning to disappear and it's coming towards the description by gene. So morphics has already happened. People don't have Stargardt disease anymore. They have ABCA4 already, etc. And that, I think, will come. It may take a little longer to come to some parts of the world. It may take even longer to go into the textbooks. But it will come, because that's the only way you can do that for a bit. Just an example, these are all patients with mutations in body beetle genes. And none of them have RP. Central maculopathy, areas of autofluorescence around the hypoautofluorescence, around the hyperautofluorescence, sometimes with patchy preservation. And none of these features are specific. There are many, many, many genes that will give you exactly the same features. Same with the OCT pictures. Sometimes with subfovial uh, hyperreflectivity, presumably loss, possibly small cysts, possibly subretinal fluid, impossible to say. It's an OCT, so it's just hyperreflective. Um, and these are all patients with body beetle syndrome, except they've got cone disease, not rod disease. As an example, the third patient down has no detectable cone function, but pretty good rod function, and yet this is body beetle. And this patient has what started off as a macular problem with loss of macular function, preservation of cones and rods, and then over time, this is a four year period, the rods dropped by about a half, the A weight became subnormal cones are going, so it's a macular plus peripheral rod, and the cones are on their way. And five years ago, this would have been unthinkable, because we didn't realize that genes in the body of beetle group could give you this phenotype. And that's now changing. Now, this is a patient who's got an 18 month history of deteriorating vision, fund eye normal, possible slight change on the central autofluorescence left eye, but otherwise the autofluorescence is fine. When you look at the OCTs, that's normal, that's normal, that's normal. So there's nothing on the OCT. And you do the electrophysiology, and the rod function is completely normal. The bright flash ERG is completely normal. The cones show marked delay and some amplitude reductions, but particularly delay central pattern ERG almost undetectable, peripheral pattern ERG detectable, so the patient has a cone dystrophy with a normal fundus, normal OCT, and normal autofluorescence imaging. Function, not structure. Imaging structure, yeah, fantastic, but it 
doesn't tell you whether this thing was working or you looked at the present. This is why function and structure need to be regarded together. So the cone dystrophy, we completely normal it. And when we do the multifocal, again, you can see the area of central loss, which is marked, confirm the central maculopathy and the patinology showing preservation peripherally in keeping with the preservation of the multifocal. Now, if the macula does look abnormal, then you've got decisions to take. Because it could be a pure maculopathy, which is your ERG is going to be normal, or it could be cone dystrophy or a cone rod dystrophy, or one of the odd ones which don't quite fit into those categories. And this is where the ERG is essential. Of course, you may find a bullseye lesion, in which case the textbooks will tell you there's a good chance the patient's got a cone dystrophy, and in this child with this bullseye lesion, he does have a cone dystrophy, but the rods are completely normal, cones are delayed and reduced, central macula down, abnormalities of the on response and the off response. I'm not going to go into this, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, so he's got a cone dystrophy. When Malik Curtis Levin was doing a fellowship with Alan Bird and myself back in 2001, we published a series of 42 consecutive bullseye lesions inherited, excluded all the toxic stuff. Only three had a cone dystrophy. So it's not as common as the textbooks would tell you. So if you've got dysfunction confined to the macula, your ERG would be normal. In terms of the genetic determinants of maculopathy, OBCA4 and PLPH2 produced through peripheral RDS are by far the most common. This is recessively inherited, this is dominantly inherited. So really important that you establish inheritance patterns because the risk of the child, of course, changes from one in 50 to one in two. And both can have generalized dysfunction. Now, when Noemi Lewis was doing a fellowship with Alan and myself back in the late 90s, we separated the Stardar patients, HCA4 disease patients, into dysfunction confined to the macula, macula plus generalized cone, macula plus cone plus rod. And at the time, when Alan posed the question to me as the electrophysiologist, we didn't know the gene. We didn't know what we were dealing with. And the question was, some patients with Stardar do badly, some do well. Do they have the same disease? Or are there different diseases within that? Now, of course, we know the genetic change might be sensible. But we had cross-sectional data which suggested the group one disease had a much better prognosis than group three disease. And then Kaoru Fujinami came back and we looked at the same cohort of patients between nine and 12 years follow-up. It's a reasonable length of follow-up. And every single patient who had an initial rod ERG abnormality, it didn't matter what the fungus showed, it didn't matter anything else, they had a rod ERG abnormality, they had progressive disease, clinically and electrophysiologically. And only one in five patients with a normal full field ERG showed any significant deterioration. So from a prognostic point of view, not diagnostic, but prognostic, you get the patient with ABC4, the first thing they do is say, well, okay, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna be able to drive? No. Am I gonna be able to read? Maybe. Am I still going to have navigational vision? Well, if you're in a group one disease, the chances of retaining navigational vision are extremely high. If you've got this group three disease, those chances are much, much reduced. So it's important prognostic. So this is a patient who came 1999 and 2009. Here, some hypo autofluorescent flex, some hypo autofluorescent. And we at the time anticipated that hyperautofluorescent reflected increased metabolic activity at the level of the RPE, which would result in cell death, and would eventually over time become hypoautofluorescent. And indeed, that's what happens, because when you look at these areas here, they're all now hypoautofluorescent. The area of central atrophy is dramatically increased. This vessel, of course, this vessel, Note the peripillary sparing, which is common in ACA4 disease, and very similar features in the left eye. Fetal acuity state exactly the same. OCT, well, they're pretty images, but they're not very helpful in ACA4 disease. 
what's far more important is the force of persons. And the electrical physiology, the patient went from 49 years to 59 years of age, so there's been a slight change related to age, but other than that, the ERT has shown no significant change over a 10, 10 year period. This is a patient with group two disease, they've had cone involved at the beginning, and the reason I'm showing this case is just to demonstrate that many of you will know that the flex can disappear over time. They resolve, you lose the flex. So whilst here you make a diagnosis instantly of obesity and core disease, here it's not so easy. And in that patient, the ERG, which started off showing cone abnormality, the rod became involved. In this patient, it's got progressive disease. The A weight drops from 300 to about 150 microvolts. So this is progressive disease involved in cone systems. This is another patient um, between 1997 and 2009. And this is very severe disease. This is a very particularly nasty sort of variant to have. Um, but it, unless you're experienced, you probably wouldn't immediately think ABCA4. You wouldn't think of Scion, you look at those. And she, when we first saw it, had no cone function, and just a little bit of raw function. And by 2009, that was almost gone. So you can lose pretty much all rapid function in a disease which the textbooks tell you is a macular dystrophy. This is a patient who's had disease for 30 years. Area of massive central atrophy, full of the RG is completely normal. The only abnormality in the central macula. And just to demonstrate now, when you look at this appearance here, autofluorescence. This patient has the same autofluorescent appearance, but this patient has a dominant cone dystrophy related to mutation of GUCA1A with preservation of rods and loss of cones. So the imaging is non specific. It won't let you make a diagnosis. You put the electrophysiology with the imaging, then you've got a chance. And we're now realizing that the nature of the variants in ACA4 determine the disease. Not surprising but you need a reasonably large group to be able to do that. And the group of more fields we have is, I remember reading, six, seven hundred patients with ABCA4, all of which have been genotyped. And if you've got biallelic mutations, which are null, so you predict no functioning protein, then you get rapid progression, they have early disease, and they're legally blind for the full decade at least. Examples of this, Seven-year-old, it starts off with no flex. By the age of eight, you get flex. Different patient here between 11 and 14, flex to start with, and then they're gradually resorbed. And these patients, as they get older, mark pigmented deposition. So these are confirmed mutations in ABCA4. This is what used to be called startup disease. And you can predict the autofluorescence, and Anna Farkin did this work, very nice work. She predicted that this is what would happen so you start off by seeing a bit of central atrophy, then some flex, and then they become hyper autofluorescent And then we looked at the patients by age who corresponded to this feature, and lo and behold, this is a seven and year old, these are teenagers, these are young adults, these are middle aged. And that's the progression of the curves. So Anna was correct in that prediction. RDS peripherin, different ballpark because it's dominantly inherited, much more severe in terms of effect on the family, because each child's going to have a 50% risk of getting the disease. And RDS, it encodes a structural protein that keeps the other sectors together, maintains that structure. And it was Dick Weller's group who first, I think it was 1995, showed that you were going to get RP, cone dystrophy, macular dystrophy, within the same family. So they must carry the same mutation, but they have very different phenotypic expression. We don't and this is from Camille Boone's lovely work. And each of these reflects variants which have been shown to be disease causing. And the green ones and the light blue ones can all have different diseases, even with the mutation of the same locus. It's complicated, it's not easy. So this is a cysteine deletion at 119. You look at this and you think, gosh, that's horrible. This patient's got bad disease. And you're absolutely right, because the ERGs are virtually undetectable. Now, 
all of these patients have got the same mutation. They've all got the most common mutation, which is 172. This patient's got a macular dystrophy electrophysiologically. This patient's got a cone dystrophy electrophysiologically. This patient's got a macular dystrophy. And this patient, who you may think has a macular dystrophy, actually has a severe cone rod dystrophy. So the electrophysiology helps you cancer. And one of the things which isn't shown here, and you can't tell by looking, and you wouldn't begin to guess, is that this and this is a mother and son pair. Go figure. Having looked at photoreceptor disease, you can also get a disease within the, either the first synapse or within the bipolar cells themselves, and that will give you a so-called negative EMRG. So you lose the blood specific ERG, but then when you use a bright flash, the A wave comes out as normal, the B wave might be reduced, and that's a so-called negative ERG. So electrically we get a normal A wave because the photoreceptors are working. Either the first synapse or bipolar cells stop working, so the A wave is preserved. Lots of causes of negative ERG. These are acquired, these are inherited. We'll just look at one or two. Now, this is a patient whose child is referred to us with a diagnosis of RP from elsewhere. Fundi, completely normal, imaging completely normal, family history of night blindness, rod specific ERG, undetected. It's exactly the same as the patient we've seen with RP, which is severe. Then when you put the bright flash, the A wave, 230 microvolts, undilated, completely normal. So that excludes rod photoreceptor loss, it excludes the diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa, and you get the negative ERG shape, which is very typical for the disease that we mentioned earlier on, congenital stationary night blindness. When we look at the cone system, this is where shape starts to come in. Because the commencement of the A wave is exactly the same as normal, but then the A wave has a broadened trunk, a sharply rising peak, reduced B to A ratio, loss of the photon facilitated entropy with a wiggle along the B wave. So this is where shape is important, because this particular shape is diagnostic of loss of the on pathway within the cone system and preservation of the off pathway. And that preservation, that loss, tell us that we're dealing with the so-called complete form of CSMB, which in an X-linked pedigree means that the gene involved is NYX. There's only two genes been implicated in X-linked disease. One gives you so-called complete CSMB, and the other, cat one f gives you so-called incomplete CSMB. CSMB is mostly X-linked, recessive and dominant. Recessive is relatively rare, but dominant is extremely rare, and it relates mostly to rhodopsin mutation. Patients are night blind from birth. The X link complete are mostly myopic. The incomplete will sometimes have nystagmus because they have cone problems, which you'll see in a second. But what's all this complete and incomplete business? Why is it? What, what do we mean by this? Well, this was terminology which was originally coined by Yosemite back in 1985, I think maybe in 86, 86. And it was all based on whether there was or was not detectable rod function. So when we look at this patient here, which is similar to the one we just looked at, the rod-specific ERG is undetectable. We see the classical shape here: preservation of the on pathway, loss of the off pathway. Uh, sorry, preservation of the off pathway, loss of the on pathway. And then when we separate on and off pathway function, we see an electronegative on response, preservation of the off response. I don't want to go into that in further detail. In incomplete CSMB, there is a detectable rod response. The bright flash ERG. Exactly the same, the electronegative. There's involvement with the off pathway, so the cone ERGs are far, far, far more abnormal in so called incomplete than in so called complete CSMB. They're not good names. They're historical names. Eventually they can change because at the moment you get parents sitting in the waiting room saying, Oh, your child's got incomplete, mine's got complete CSMB. You know, and it doesn't mean anything. It's completely crazy. But What's relevant is that this appearance, the shape here, this U-shaped where you lose both A wave and B wave, 
it was the off bipolar cell confusion, the A wave manifests itself here, but not here because these are dot pathway preservation. This is dot pathway loss. And then you get this classic triphasic appearance, which is very almost patronymonic of the incomplete CSMBs. The mutations listed here are those which have found the recessive diseases. So we're getting better and better at identifying these disorders. TRPM1, which is one of the causes of recessive disease here, complete form actually has a naturally occurring animal correlate, which is how we reported it in the first place. We will the first group by a week to report the CRPM1 as a cause of complete CSMB. And it occurs naturally in the upper lizard horse. And what's relevant here is that it's expressed in melanocytes. More about that later when we come to these disorders. Now this is a 14-year-old who comes in with no family history but has paraphobial white dots. Central OCT was unremarkable, what's an old OCT? And there's some hyperal diversities. So you look at that and you think macular dystrophy. And you do the ERG, and the rod ERG is delayed and reduced, so it's not a macular dystrophy. Retinas are fine. You do the bright flash ERG, and the B wave is smaller than the A wave, so it's electronegative. You look at the flicker ERG, it's marginally delayed, but the important thing here, if you look at the cone single flash ERG, there's a B to A ratio of reduction, which is profound, but the overall shape is still pretty good, other than that the B wave is small. We haven't got that change in shape of the A wave with the silver season. But it's an electronegative waveform. And the two most commonly inherited disorders which give you an electronegative waveform are CSMB or extant stasis. There's no evidence of stasis, and the patient's not light blind. But those are the two gene groups the electrophysiology tells you to screen. So you do the screening. Oh, sorry. I forgot I forgot those on the do And the patient's got positive mutation in RS1, so this patient has excellent retinal skysis. With no skysis on the OCT, no skysis visible in the fungus, and presenting with paraphobia with my Excellent skysis. Now, all of the, so this is the classical skittic appearance on an OCT. You get the spoke wheel lesion and the phobia, but don't forget, of course, that, that will disappear with age. With an 18 year old or a 17 year old, you see the spoke wheel lesion usually in the fungus by the time they're 35, they have non specific macular atrophy. Now, all of the following patients have got confirmed excellent retinal sciences, electrophysiologically confirmed by the mental screen. So, this patient has got the same mutation as the previous one. See some changes here. There's no skittic changes on the OCT, and there's some white dots, odd features in the periphery. This one, yep, beautiful, beautiful white changes on the autofluorescence, beautiful changes in the fungus. Here there's an evidence of pigmentary deposition, probably following a childhood detachment, and the pigment to change. Here doesn't look anything like skysis on the autofluorescence. There is skysis on the OCT, but you can't see it in the fungus. Here, see it beautifully on the OCT, you can see it in the fungus, but you can't see it on the autofluorescence. Here, well, who would have said that that was extra skysis? And all of these patients have got confirmed extra skysis. This one's got the normal autofluorescence, uh, normal OCT, these have got confirmed. But if you look at these, that's the only one probably you think immediately has stasis. But they're all confirmed with electrophysiology. Now this is a patient who's night blind, non-progressive, and there are white dots extending out into the periphery. The other eyes are the same. We do the ERG, oh sorry. We do the photopic ERGs, and they're all completely normal. Flicker ERG, single flash, pattern ERG, on and off responses, s ERGs, don't worry about these. But they're all normal. And then we do our bright flash. Now, of course, one of the possibilities, if you've got white dots, is fungus alpha and tunnels. 
Then we do our rods specific ERG and it's done detectable, and we have a B wave that's smaller than the A wave that was done in battery. So, time to play games again. Who thinks the patient had fungus elder mutatus? Well, they do have, do they have something different? First, classical RDH5 mutation, fungus elder mutatus. So, anything else? Okay, so it's a question. A question which is yet to be answered. So we have to go back to basics. We know that we have to look at the signals and the signal origins. We know that we have to look at the disease. So we can work out the signal origins, which we will do shortly. But what do we know about the disease? Well, fungus alpha mutatus is well characterized. It relates to mutation in RDH5, which encodes in the retinol dehydrogenase. So it's involved in the recycling of redoxin within the RPE. So after you've started off the phototransduction cascade by photosummarizing redoxin, it's then got to return to its original state. So you need something to convert retinol back to retinol. But we also know that if you leave these patients in the dark for long enough, the redoxin regenerates naturally. So the redoxin level will normalize. If you look at it in terms of, this is from Dave Travis's beautiful paper, so this is in the rod outer segment. Light comes along, I summarize this, et cetera, et cetera, here through the phototransduction cascade. Transretinol goes back into the RPE, where it gets converted back into retinal with RDH5 linking in the cellular <coughs> retinal type binding protein. That's the same patient with two hours of start presentation. In many cases, you will have to do this overnight. Two hours will not be enough. But now, we can make the diagnosis because we've demonstrated what we understand the pathophysiology. We know that if you dive it out the patient for a long period of time, redoxin level normalize. If redoxin level normalize, you get normal rod function. So let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. So here's our dim flash. After 20 minutes dark adaptation, standard dark adaptation, there's no redoxin, so this is undetectable. Our red flash tells us we've got a cone isolated retina with no rod function. So then as we increase stimulus strength, we get the normal changes anticipated in light adapted cones, but under dark adaptation because there's no rod function there. So we can see that in fact what is called the photon hill that curiosity, where almost paradoxically, as you increase strength, A wave increases, but B wave gets smaller, actually occurs naturally in cones all the time. It's just that you have to remove the rods before you can see it. And this is normal cone function. It's a normal property of cones, photonic fields, but occurring under dark adaptation. And that's why it appears to be an electronegative ERG. It's what I call the pseudo electronegative because the origins aren't from the rod system. So it's using the red flag, which is not part of the ISO standard, which helps us to make that decision. Now, if we've got disease in the, I need to move on a bit. RPE disease, then we need to do an EOG. We have electrodes at the side of the eye. This is a really, really old photograph. And this is in homage to Jeffrey Arden, who was one of my mentors, and I succeeded him at Moorfields and he passed away sadly earlier this year. He was still active researching him just before he died. Um, and this is from him. So this is the way the electrode used to be run. We had to put two ground electrodes on because they were old amplifiers. But what they de demonstrated was that I mean, as you move the eyes from side to side, so you get a signal. Because the eye is like a little battery, cornea positive, retina negative. And as you move that battery from side to side, the electrodes at the side of the eye, as you move this way, this becomes more positive, this becomes more negative. That way you get a deflection in one direction. And when you move the eyes back in the other direction, this becomes more negative, this becomes more positive, and the deflection goes the other way. And it was noted, and this was also done by Crossline Ghent in Belgium, uh, and Frederick Baruch also, that as you go through darkness, so you reach a minimum, and as you go into light, you reach a maximum, and we know that the so-called light rise reflects a progressive 
depolarization of basal membranes of the RPD. So the EOG is telling us about the interaction between the rod fetch receptors and the RPD. The most common disease with which EOG recording is associated is best disease, the total macular dystrophy. Uh, they used to call it BMD2, but now they changed it to best one. But in coat, a stroke, and, and the chloride channels which are responsible for the depolarization of the basal membrane in light, those chloride channels are made up of polymeric stroke. <coughs> this is a patient who's got classic best of disease, the so-called egg yolk lesions, six six vision in both eyes. And the classic thing about best of disease is that the ERG is completely normal and the EOG is completely flat. And indeed, in that patient, that's what you see. So the ERG is absolutely pristine. Even the pattern ERGs over those telephone lesions are completely normal, and the EOG is completely flat. This is best disease. This is a 13-year-old who's got a distortion of vision in the left eye, family history of a so-called macular dystrophy, no further information. And there's a drusenoid type deposit in the left fovea, explaining the vacuity loss, and that's as far as we know. But when we do the electrophysiology, ERG is completely normal. Where the visible lesion is, there's a pattern ERG reduction, so that's a left maculopathy, and the EOG is flat, it's completely flat, showing that this is a rare but recognized unilateral best disease. Picked up by the EOG, and that's where the EOG is particularly useful. What happens if you've got a sick year old? Are we really going to sit them in dark? 20 minutes, making movements from side to side, and then do it again in light. Ooh, there's no need because the disease is inherited in a dominant fashion. So you test those children. And one of the two parents will carry the mutation, the variant, and that parent will have probably a flat ERG. So test the parents. These following cases are all examples of what you can get in confirmed best diseases. Just the nature of the autocularity, the nature of the fungus abnormality. These are all confirmed cases. Sometimes with what looks like deposition. In other instances, hyporeflective areas, presumably subrunner fluid. And you can get, of course, multifocal best disease with the with massive hyporeflective areas. More recently described, also the more recessive best retinopathy. And the reason this is important is that mutation in the same gene which gives you best disease in a dominant fashion, if you have a biallelic mutation, you get a recessively inherited retinal dystrophy. And these patients have ERG abnormality not just the EOG abnormality. But it was detected originally, Bart Noir and, uh, and I and Andrew Webster worked with Graham Black in Manchester, we defined it and named it. Um, these patients have a diffuse RP irregularity, they have flecked lesions, which are not like the extramacular lesion to get in best disease, and they don't look much spark on either. And their ERGs are abnormal, and they have flat ERGs. These are typical examples. And what's distinctive is that they all have the similar features, but they're not features which have a particular pattern to them. There's this diffuse irregularity, there's punctate lesions, there's the odd white spot, it's hypoed, hypoed, or fluorescent. Here there's a photo of skittic change. And this patient was carrying a diagnosis of atypical stargar because of the peripapillary preservation of the autofluorescence. This patient was carrying a misdiagnosis with Dalton Favre syndrome because of the central sky seclusions. Uh, this patient, but they've all got similar features, but if you have to say what they are, they're, they're not the same as each other, but they're very similar. And what's also similar is their EOGs are um, pretty much flat. The patients have these are progressively more retinal disease, but they've all got ERG abnormalities. It's progressive, you can get scar formation, peripheral atrophy here. And this is a patient between 2001 and 2006, showing increasing delay in the flicker ERG and progressive loss of rod receptor function. And what's 
it's particularly, oh, they also get anterior, they can get closed angles, they can get glaucoma, that's not uncommon. They often have subretinal fluid. But again, this sort of patchy, odd sort of flex lesions which aren't really flex. They all have the same indistinct pattern about the mouth. And the kids are particularly interesting because they have these dome-shaped lesions, particularly common in the children, which are very distinct. Okay, um, diagnostic ERGs, right. Adrian asked me to put these in, we'll skip through it pretty quickly because these are, these are rare and we need to get onto the quiet of these and can take them longer than I should. So this is a patient, 44 years of age, spectacles since childhood, night lights since childhood, hypothyroidism, megaloblastic anemia, leading to B, leading B12, and the referral came in, could this be an option for Roth? In fact, the BP didn't show that. You look at the fundus, and it's pretty much unremarkable. But then when you do autofluorescence, you say there's something completely different. You've got an area of like pro autofluorescence. She became known as, by the fellows at Morfield as banana lady because of the shape of these lesions. And then you've got some other peripheral lesions. The OCT, there's some intraretinal hyperreflectivity, presumably cystic spaces. In a retinal level. And the ERGs are distinctive and diagnostic. The rod specific ERG is undetected. Feature one. Feature two is exactly the same wave shape between a dark adaptive 3 response and a light adaptive 3 response. Don't normally show this, but here it's important because the shape is exactly the same. The A wave is extremely delayed. Here you've got the B wave shown better, um, but massive delay, simplification of wave shape. And the third feature relates to the flicker ERG, because the flicker ERG amplitude is smaller than that of the single flash cone ERG B wave. And that's the only disease in which this occurs, in my experience. This doesn't happen in any case. And these features together are diagnostic of enhanced test cancer which relates to mutation in NR3. You can then do s cone ERGs, and you see why it's called enhanced s cone syndrome, because the s cone ERGs done with a blue flash on an orange background and color are huge compared to the normal. It was first described by Mike Marmer and Dick Gulliver, Sam Jacobson, back in 1992, I think it was, set of the inherited. They are night blind from birth, reason for that will become apparent shortly. And they have maculopathy sometimes, not always. Their ERG is diagnostic. You don't need anything except ERG to make a diagnosis. And the reason they're night blind is night blind, they don't have any rods. NR2E3 encodes a transcription factor, so that transcription factor is essentially telling the cells what to become. And if you're a, a stem cell and you've got the car and receptor, you can choose a product or an S-cone or an M-cone, but the default pathway seems to be short wavelength cones, or at least cones which contain a short wavelength peak. They don't necessarily behave quite like that. And myelin did, did some wonderful histology, and they effectively degenerate. Uh, some of the cones even co-express an NIOMOXIN and an S-conoxin. I've got no idea how those cells work. Just can't, can't imagine. All of these patients now have enhanced test cone syndrome, just showing the variations in fungus appearance. Here there's some hypopigmented hyper, areas which might per autofluoresce. Again, typical features, no rod ERG, single flash, GA3 and LA3, same wave shape, flicker ERG, smaller than the A wave, absolutely diagnostic, big S cone ERGs. Multifocal ERG showing preservation only centrally. Patient here with normal fundus, here with some early pigmentary changes, here with a more common pigmentary deposition, and it may not be too obvious here, but this is deep. The pigmentation is not intraretinal, it's at the level of the RPE, which you can see, but you won't necessarily pick up the fundus. Pictures here presented with stenosis and reduced acuity. 
see what's getting there. Here, temperature changes. And again, they're numular lesions. They're not bone stickers. They're numular or coin-shaped lesions. Circular deposition on the level of the RPE. This is more distinctive. This is a sort of classic appearance. Preservation of fluorescence only in the central area here. This is her sister. This is the father of the six-year-old who had the normal fungus. And you think, oh, 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 hang on, this is recessive. Pseudodominant inheritance of white carrot genes. The other, one of the other disorders is counter super super morodi RG, first described by Peter Gurus. We reported the gene in KCME 2 in 2006, and we knew we found it for us. And it was the first gene in humans to identify a gene encoding a potassium channel as a cause of rare disease. It's recessive, it's early onset, uh, range of macular appearances, it's progressive. Many of them are myopic. One or two microbes, color vision, not surprised because they've got maculopathy, some night blindness, one or two patients with nystagmus. And they have a distinctive phenotype with a very dim flash with no detected ERG, usually round about the ISO standard. There is an ERG detectable, but it's profoundly delayed. And the first time I saw this, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that you'd get a rod specific ERG. 150 milliseconds. I just looked at it and said, This has got to be an island. It's got to be. But then we investigated and we saw another case, etc. And then, as you get brighter, you get this distinctive shape. The A wave starts normally, hesitates, dips a little bit, and then shoots up. And this is why Peter called it super normal, because you've now got nothing with a dim flash compared to the normal where you might get 200 microvolts. But here, the B wave rather than being 500 or so microvolts, is 800 microvolts. And that's the so-called supernormal. Most patients do not have supernormal from the RGs. So the name isn't right uh, for most people, but it was the one, you know, Peter saw his one case, and it was named on the basis of that one case. And it's true, you can get it, but most patients don't show them. If we look more specifically, this is patient the only abnormality central atrophy, Delayed flicker ERG, that's the current dystrophy part. Massively delayed or specific ERG, nothing with a dim flash. Characteristic change here. And if you look now, the way it builds up, you can see it's completely different. So the reasonably uniform increase that you expect in normal, here you go from nothing to usually delayed to shooting up to 600 microvolts. And there you see the classic shape only with the bright flash. A wave comes down, sits a bit, drops, and shoots upwards. These are OCTs in the same disease. They're all different. I mean, here you've got subfolial hyporeflectivity. You've got lipid hypofolial hyperreflectivity. Here, 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 generalized atrophy. They're all different. And these are autofluorescent images. Again, all different. These are driven by age. So as you get older, you tend to have central atrophy in the ring, my pearl reflects. But when you're young, you leave the big room. The electrophysiology makes the diagnosis. The last disease in this instance is RGS9 mutation or bradyopsia. So this is a patient who's got particularly going from dark to light. So you immediately think of cone disease. And you do your ARGs, and the rod specific ERG is fine, the A3 is fine. There's no detectable flicker, and there's a very low amplitude single flash. And there's a calibration change here, but these are really small. So you think this is probably achromatopsia, possibly glucomyphromacy. And you look a bit more carefully, and what we're missing in there? Our famous red flash, which gives us so much information. And that, curiously, is normal. So we've got a patient who's got no cone function under light elevation, which is when the cone is supposed to work. And under dark elevation, the cones are beautifully seen. That's very strange. And then when we go from DA3 to DA10, 11 in this instance, the ERG, which should get larger, gets smaller. More shock column. 
So there's something affecting the recovery. Because when we go from a 20 second stimulus interval to a 30 second, up to 50 seconds, we get demonstrated recovery. And now the ERG follows the same pattern as normal. But you have to do this to demonstrate. You have to have a technician who's sharp, and then you have to tell the technician what to do. And that's how we detected it and discovered it. But that's a different story. So cone function is normal on dark adaptation. There's a delayed recovery from a bright flash. And this is mutation in RGS9 or the anchor protein R9P. What about cone system if we look at it slightly differently? Well, if you start the stimulus with a very dim flash under dark adaptation, you get a response, which is fine. That's for two seconds. After 10 seconds, it's disappeared and it's completely fine because there's no recovery taking place. And equally, when we do the SKNERG, it is coming from the SK. Well, we're not quite on track, but we're moving through this reasonably quickly. Right, we've looked at inherited disease. Now we're going to look at some acquired disease. To start off with vascular disease. Now, you all recognize this as a central artery problem. That's not a problem. But I got a phone call once from Gordon Plant who thought he had a patient with a traumatic optic neuropathy, who was an elderly woman who'd been dancing with a broom handle. <laughs> Go figure. Um, she and her husband used to be very keen on dancing. Her husband had passed away. She had a couple of gins. She put some music on and started dancing with a broom handle, but her husband wasn't there anymore. Poked herself in the eye with a broom handle and turned up a more hooks casualty 12 hours later with an vision. It was assumed to be a traumatic optic neuropathy, because the front has been normal. But broad ERG was undetectable, bright flash ERG is electronegative, flicker ERG is delayed, so of course this is a central progressive artery occlusion. But it's taken so quickly following the presumed event, which we do not think is related to the poking itself in the eye, that there is major change. And of course you can get, as you'll see later, reperfusion following some broad artery. Now this is another patient of Gordon's, but the question mark here was the patient's got a pale disc, narrow vessels, but normal visual acuity. So is the primary problem in the object nerve or in the retina? That was the question we were asking. Because of course, if you had an inflammatory optic neuropathy, you can get left with a pale disc and normal visual acuity, such as demyelinating disease. Um, he's got risk factors, so you tend to think it's vascular, if this is a CRAO, so his vision doesn't add up. And the PAT VEP is shown no delay. The flash VEP does show delay compared to the other side. So we've got an abnormality in a flash VEP, but not a PAT VEP. Three things can do that generalized retinas, <coughs> nerve sheath disease, very, very rarely demyelination. <coughs> so this, of course, in the context of the patient disc and narrow vessels, now think of retinal disease. When you do the ERGs, no rod specific ERG, profoundly electronegative with additional A waves, big delay in the flicker. So, this of course is an old central retinal artery occlusion with a cilia retinal artery preserving the blood supply from the macula, leaving you with normal visual acuity. But other than that, with the signs of an old CRA pale disc, narrow vessels. But if you've got normal acuity in that constellation, don't immediately send the patient for an MRI because you're going to do that. But these patients will usually have two or three MRIs by the time the neurologist sends them to the ophthalmologist. And the ophthalmologist usually then makes the diagnosis when they do the ERG. Of course, with the CRA, you're looking at the duality of the blood supply to the retina, that receptor supply by through toroidal circulation by the short posterior ciliaries, inner retina supply through central retina. This is a five year old. Mummy's dress looks like grass. You think everything's gone green. Well, that can happen, but this isn't it. What she's talking about is the grass that when you stand at a field and you look at the field <coughs> and the wind blows, and it starts to wave and undulate, and you get patterns in the grass. That's what she knows. She knows it's distortion. Sorry, he. Um, on examination, this is pan uveitis for cells in the anterior chamber of the vitreous. Diffuse edema, we've looked at these in a minute. 
medical history of chickenpox, family history of active tuberculosis, and there is dipendia in the house. The doctor who saw her, which was Graham St. Thomas, was very, very experienced, had no idea what was going on. So she was empirically started with high dose IV steroids, antivirals, anti TB, MRI was normal, CSF showed no clear psychosis. And you've got a very fluid filled retina. Note the disparity between the normal caliber of the vein and the artery. But other than that, there's really nothing to explain why the patient's only got 90 seconds. Fluorescent, and the, we were given these, we had no control over them. There's a hot disc, you know, there's inflammatory disease, there's one or two deep features, but again, nothing to explain light perception. Same with the other eye. And that's when she was referred for electrophysiology. Could this be an optic neuropathy? Could it be related to the family thought, which is in the house? And we all know that five and six-year-olds go around, they see bottles, they see tablets, they think, these are sweets. They eat them. It happens. It shouldn't, but it happens. And she has virtually no detectable flash of BPP. P, sorry, and the white C was under the dog assessing the right as well. But he also no ERG. Absolutely not a hint of any retinal activity on the surgical cancer. Even when you blow these up to ridiculous levels, it's not. Ten days later, developing ghost vessels, things are beginning to shut down. This is not looking good at all. So he's got rapid catastrophic visual loss. We were presuming this was a vasculitis second chicken box. Doppler showed, look, PCR was negative. Doppler showed no identifiable central retinal artery or retinal vein. But of course, that does not explain the ERG. Because the ERG showed completely undetectable signals. That implicates the first receptors. The first receptors are not supplied using this circulation. They're supplied by toroidal circulation. So the patient had stir MRI and geography. And then we see the full horror of what's going on, because you think these look pretty good, except there's no blood supply to deal with. And this poor kid had bilateral ophthalmic artery failure. Sadly, there was no recovery. He lost out of rhythm completely. Um, he had systemic acyclic to stop everything that's happening, and he didn't get any vision back. And we eventually found IgG in the CSF was related to the chicken. And strangely, the first time I showed this case in Singapore, I, I was unaware of this until I heard, until we saw this case open then, but chicken box is one of the most common causes of childhood stroke. And there was a, an ophthalmologist in the audience who actually had a child who had chicken box and 10 weeks later stroke down. So it happens. Patient with SLE, obviously being treated, obviously being treated with hydroxychloroquine, and this is now a major referral issue for the electrophysiology unit. Does the patient have hydroxychloroquine toxicity? Full field ERG is in this patient completely normal, pat the ERG down so the patient has maculopathy. When we do the multifocal, we see what Jonathan Lyons, who first used this, describes as a ring defect, with preservation of the central foveal hexapon response, loss of the surrounding responses. So this is very typical for hydroxychloroquine. One year later, you see the classical flying saucer sign on the OCT. Uh, less marked here, but you can still see early thinning and paraphobic distribution. I think we'll skip that in the issue. Now, inflammatory disease, birdshot is not something I have seen in Asia. It doesn't exist in Asia. But it's instrumental in showing this particular case anyway of how you can use the object of chronic complication demonstrated by electrophysiology both to instigate and then modify management. So the ERGs can be abnormal in Birchot, an inflammatory is correct choreopathy. You see these deep cream choroidal lesions. And they always have 30 and split ERGs. Now this is a patient who with a normal looking right eye presented with close to slow vision in the left eye. The right eye images beautifully, autoversus beautifully, 
left eye, diffuse retinal edema, some focal changes, acrophobia, and some speculative curve or temporal essence within the arcade. And when we do the electrophysiology, left eye, which is a symptomatic eye, shows no rod specific ERG, bright flashes down. The asymptomatic right eye also shows a delay in the brain. So there's asymptomatic dysfunction occurring in the right eye, which we're picking up with the electrophysiology. And there's big delay in the left eye. And so it continues, but don't detect what was happening in the RG. Now, in the context of Birdshot, this is actually relatively mild. So the patient's treated only with oral steroids for three months. And what we're going to do, if we just look here, that's after three months of treatment. Complete restoration of function in the world specific ERG. The bright flash ERG recovers. The 30 hertz flicker ERG normalizes bilaterally, so we get a successful treatment of the asymptomatic disease. The patent, whoops, sorry. The patent ERG recovers. And this is a successful treatment. So you can objectively demonstrate the efficacy of treatment. You can then tail the treatment off slowly because if you do it too quickly you get a rebound which is harder to treat and you can then modify your treatment regime modifying it mo sorry monitoring it with the RG to determine that you've got stability we would initially see the patient every three months after they've got stable function and we've got one patient who's maintained on one milligram steroids <laughs> a day just one milligram is almost you know, it's, it's it's homeopathic almost. Uh, but it keeps the retina under control. And we monitor that with electrophysiology. So the electrophysiology allows you to determine the success of the treatment, when to, do to treat, to treat, to treat, um, as they put it, aggressively or not. So the severity of the disease can be demonstrated objectively, and we then determine whether it's just to use steroids or steroids plus administration. One of the most common Inflammatory type disorders is Azure. Now, this is a patient with straightforward mutes. Here are the inflammatory lesions. Don't know what that is, but it's not uncommon. The patient has a dense central scotoma. And if you have straightforward mutes on the left less than right dot syndrome, the patients recover spontaneously. They don't need treatment. But mutes is one of those disorders which can trigger an Azure cubitonal abnormality at presentation. That's the patient who will have positive phenomena. So if the patient presents with mutes and flashing lights within the scotoma region, then beware that it's probably a zoo and not mutes. Because in mutes, there's spontaneous recovery. This is six months, as this is one year later. The lesions are all gone except for this one. You know what it is. And the ERG completely normal at the beginning. Patent ERG undetectable. One year later, ERG remains completely normal. Patent ERG recovers. This patient was not treated. The patient with very similar appearance, even to the we don't recognize, but this patient came in with photopsias as well as pierceries. When we look at the fluorescent, you can see the areas here which are abnormal. And ICG is best if looking long term sequely, but you see it's better on ICG than you do on. Fluorescent, fluorescent lesions would go on more quickly. And it was a patient of Alan Bird's, and Alan couldn't explain the level of visual acuity loss, so asked for BEPs just in case of loss of nerve tissues. And they are indeed very abnormal, but that's a consequence of not detecting the pattern of function. When we look at the flicker ERG, it's mild and delayed. The ERG is reduced, so there's RPE disease, there's special sense disease. This is a sort of Multifocal shows you the true extent of the disease. And if you remember looking at the fundus and looking at the fluorescent, the ICG, most of what we were looking at appears to be functioning reasonably well. Not at all. All completely lost. The patient now who's. Yeah, one second. Uh, we thought had old inflammatory disease and coupled with new inflammatory disease. So it's a 13 year old, and we first saw when he was nine. This is the current state of play. 
what we saw in the movie is nine. He did have some function remaining in the right eye. He was still tapping on G. He's got various drusen, which concentrates the pain. He's got nerve head drusen. But he was basically losing his ERG. And he started off with a normal ERG. <coughs> then he lost a little bit of A wave and a bit more B wave. And then he continued losing B wave with less A wave. So he's got progressive inner retinal disease, also with some photoreceptor loss. We had no idea what it was. And this poor kid was coming back and repeating our genes, repeating the gene. Nobody had a clue. And then we had an American fellow said, well, if this is Florida, we can produce it, which had never been reported in England. And the fellow sat there and poured over the thumbs in for two hours. And we still were of the view that this was old inflammatory, this was new inflammatory. But actually, when you look very carefully, and it's complicated because it's a child, so you get lots of reflection. But once you see that, there's the little one. So it is indeed diffuse, diffuse unilateral subacute neuroadvisor. Nematode infection, usually assumed to take place through fecal oral route. And this was a kid who lived in a rural country, unheard of. It turned out his father was a diplomat, diplomatically placed in Bangladesh. The child had visited his father. Presumably that's where it picked it up because it's in, you know, if you go to South America, you go to Florida, some of the Indian subcontinent, then do some occurs. We've never seen anything. Tony Moore had never seen it before, I've never seen it before. Another case here just showing the progressive outer and inner dysfunction. But of course, now we can treat it. You used to have to treat these things with laser. If you could find it, what you did was put a ring of burns around it to stop it running away because they used to run away, they're photophobic, they don't like it. You can't find them if you look for slip um, But now you've got bendazole, and these pictures were taken over a two month period. You don't have much of the fungus appearance changing. And then after a month of the bendazole, fungus appearance normalizes. The OCT of course didn't. We've got inner retinal dysfunction demonstrated on the OCT is very thin, and that corresponds with the ERG changes. Melanoma associated red light blue, there's a perineum plastic syndrome, the patient gets an acquired night blindness, again, shimmering photopsias. You get a patient who comes in with shimmering, with photopsias, that kind of symptom, treat it seriously, because it could reflect life threatening disease, mar or cut. They usually have a history of cutaneous malignant melanoma, but every now and then you get a patient who says, oh yeah, I had a pigmented mole removed. So always ask that specific question. Somebody comes in with shimmering photopsies and acquired night blindness, they may not have been told that it was an MF. And their ERG is distinctive. And one of the reasons, oh, what I should have added on that slide, do you remember I showed you the Appaloosa horse with a cause of recessive CSMB, complete form? Well, melanoma associated retina B ERGs are indistinguishable from complete form CSMB. They have no rod specific ERG, electronegative waveform, the classic on pathway glass on pathway preservation, loss of the on pathway, preservation of the on pathway, indistinguishable. But these patients have got a different history, it's acquired, it's shimmering. And Meneo Combo's group in Nagoya showed that one of the likely causes in terms of the underlying mechanism of MA is mediated through TRPM9, which is expressed in melanocytes. And it's the active Cause of the Car is a different animal completely. It's a very rapidly aggressive disease. Pain less usually, usually visual loss of photopsias. Bilateral feels constrict. You can start off with a normal fungus, so the ERG is important. It's nearly always photoreceptive, but occasionally in a retinal. Anti retinal antibody is about that in a second. Importantly, it may precede the diagnosis of the underlying. If you do antiretinal antibodies, the two most common that you will find are anti-recovery and anti-enolase, both of which induce up the Enolase, particularly cone, recovering with cone and rod. You can do bloods, but you've got a major issue with the interpretation of any anti-retinal antibody status. 
Firstly, you have to decide, are they causative or are they reactive? Is it an epic phenomenon resulting from the retinal degeneration? Patients with retinitis pigmentosa have anti-retinitis. They're not causative, they're reactive. The other problem is this variability and therefore reliability. I'm only aware of one study which has compared the results of two different labs, and you'd think they're going to be the same, right? 36% concordance only. It's the only study that's been done. 36%. That's less than chance. Yeah. So you've got to be really careful with interpreting accurate antibody studies. Uh, many people have decided that is it worth doing them? If you're going to make a management decision, what are you going to base it on? Hepatitis may change, they come and go. You've got to decide whether it's causative or reactive. They're not easy cases. Um, now, with the, what do you want to do? We're, we're running slightly late. What do you want me to do? I mean, I can pause now and we have tea and then we continue afterwards or carry on for another five minutes and then see. Which? Would you like to take a break first? We're almost at the end of this, but it's going to be another five, six minutes. Just carry on, okay. Um, outcome measures, patients are normally done. Example, patient, a lawyer. The last thing you want on five o'clock on Friday afternoon which is when she walks into what becomes casualty. So the casualty officer will <coughs> examine the patient, as you must, took a history as you did. It's on close angle. <sighs> Relief, the patient's got glaucoma. So referred to glaucoma, they did what they do. Sadly, nothing happened, and the patient was referred by glaucoma to medical rep. And the patient's got an acquired night blindness following a viral illness accompanied by prosopsis. So it sounds all true. Fields, well, they're not glaucomatous. You look at the fungus, and you'd be forgiven for thinking there's some fluid around here. There's quite clear change of the phobia. But what really threw us out was this. Because we'd never seen it before. Even though we were the people who started autofluorescence, we had never seen this thing. And I took them up to Alan Bird. I took these images to Alan. Because we've assumed that this was pretty good other than cystoid macular edema, you get the petaloid appearance, beautiful. And we thought this was nasty. And I took up, up to Alan, and I remember it very well, because he just looked and he said, bloody hell, what's that? And we assumed that this was the bad bit. We were, of course, completely wrong. We did the electrophysiology showed massive changes in both eyes, rod and cones, at the level of the proprioceptor, right eye, worse than left. That dark area was in the left eye, not the right eye. That was the first clue which gave us a suggestion that we completely got it the wrong way around. EOG was completely down on the right, still just on the left, it produced. Multifocal ERG, the only part that's preserved in the right eye is over the systolic angle. More about that in just a second. Better preservation of the left eye, but look at the pattern of preservation. Because the pattern of preservation is consistent with the dark areas. And we've got it all wrong. The dark areas are the bits which have function, not the bits which have lost function. And there is, of course, the means that Heidelberg have, which Francis Deloria has given them, of quantifying the progression. They've had it for five years and they still haven't put it in practice. If you look at some of Janet Sparrow's wonderful work, you can quantify the other Um So it's a problem. Here we can now see what's going on. When we look at microperimetry, on the dark areas, the thresholds are completely normal. Over the light areas, they're elevated. And here, over the cystoid macular edema, the thresholds are completely normal. Outside of that area, the thresholds are elevated. And of course, if you've got cystoid macular edema, that is not affecting photoreceptor function in that area. It's just elevating the photoreceptor. 
So the photoreceptor can still phototransduce. They've still got sensitivity. They've still got measurable visual field. And that's why if you want to do research on cisplatinacular edema in that basis, do not use a multifocal MRD because you won't find it unless you've got associated macular atrophy. And this demonstrates it beautifully. And if you then look at very high resolution OTT, where you've got the light area here, you've got reduced outer segment length. And when you've got the dark areas, you've got normal outer segment length. We just still don't know what it was. So it could be a zoo, it could be carved, and not history, autoimmune, we would like to. She then saw a female doctor who got a history of vaginal bleeding. She was under OMG, and they told her not to worry. The ophthalmologist turned them up and told them to worry. They laughed at her. But they worried appropriately. They found tumor markers. She had an urgent hysterectomy, and she has endometrial small cell carcinoma, a very rare combination. And she has come. John Hacken lively kindly did some Western blocks for us to look for antiretinal antibodies. And there's a 23 kilodalton band, which is consistent with anti recovering. And there's a whole bunch of other cytotreatment, like heat shock proteins, ALDOA. We don't know what these do. And that's one of the issues of this. When you do antiretinal antibodies, you get all these results back and you look at them. What the hell does that do? And we don't know. So I think we'll skip that case and just go on to this last one before stopping. Patient, 75 years of age, no light perception, counts of fingers, catopsias, said to be out of the telephone district, but it looks like more like a macular hole, and it's got two known malignancies, carcinoma of breast and lymphoma. So we assumed as the CT head came back normal that this was carcinoma associated retinopathy. And nothing much to see in the fungus, no CT to see the hole. And the ERGs came back normal. We had no idea. So we did the EPs, and the VEPs were undetectable. But the Pat ERG, despite the fact that the patient only had counting fingers, she was able to see the light of the TV screen in front of her. She was able to maintain a degree of stability and fixation. And we still got P50 from her macula. No N95, but the important thing was the P50, which said the macula was working because this disease declined the globe. So the normal so called CT was changed, no flash VPs either, and the patient actually has carcinomous meningitis with infiltration of the optic nerve. So, the RGs. They can tell you about the nature of the severity of disease, they can separate cell types that separate cell layers, they're pretty powerful. But you have to understand their origins, you have to relate to the underlying pathophysiology. But once you do all that, they give you an insight into disease which is not available to I'm aware of any other group. You can monitor and look at safety following therapeutic intervention. Optical management needs structure and function. Don't forget the underlying pathophysiology. And I'm indebted to Owen White for this ancient Chinese thing, uh, whereby that you've got blind men examining an elephant. They all examine a different bit. They all think they're dealing with different things. But of course, examining structure without function is like that blind man, because structure is only part of the whole. And to quote Gestalt therapy, or Gestalt uh, psychology, the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you very much. Overrun slightly, but uh, we can catch up with the tea. Uh, and I'm there for tea. If anybody's got questions which are burning, um, one of you asked questions during the talk that nobody else did, so I guess you either understood it or you were asleep. But I no didn't notice anybody falling asleep. So. Uh, but I'm there for questions or ask questions now if there's anything urgent. If not, get something to drink, get something to eat, and then we'll resume afterwards. And there will be space at the end of that. Thank you.